It's your voice, your vote, and tonight, the race for South Bend Common Council. ABC 57 News helping you get to know the candidates and the major issues facing the city before you cast your ballot in the Indiana May primary elections. This time, five Democrats competing for three at-large seats on the South Bend Common Council. Hello and welcome to another ABC 57 News primary election special here on ABC 57. We're live at Y Camp Hall on campus at IU South Bend for a South Bend Common Council Candidate Forum sponsored by ABC 57, the League of Women Voters of the South Bend area and the American Democracy Project here at IU South Bend. And we're very happy to have a live audience with us for the Democratic Party primary debate as well. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. We have, however, asked the audience to remain respectful and hold their applause till the end of the event. So let's meet the candidates right away. Five of them competing to run for three citywide at-large common council seats that will be on the November general election ballot. They are seated alphabetically. First, we welcome Dr. Oliver Davis, Jr. Dr. Davis is a licensed social worker and college instructor who previously served three terms on the Common Council representing the city's sixth district and served as council president and vice president as well. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you. We also welcome incumbent Lori Hammond. Ms. Hammond is a former middle school teacher and small business owner serving her first term on the Common Council after being elected at large back in 2019. Thank you for participating as well. Thank you. Uh, we also want to welcome Laquita Hughes. Ms. Hughes is a family special education, I'm sorry, special education family support advocate, substitute teacher and daycare center owner who's previously run for South Bend School Board. Thank you for joining us, ma'am. We also welcome incumbent Rachel Tomas Morgan, who is running for a second term on the South Bend Common Council. Ms. Tomas Morgan is an administrator and teacher at Notre Dame Center for Societal Concerns, who was first elected to the Common Council back in 2016. Welcome to you as well. And we welcome incumbent Karen White. Ms. White is currently serving as City uh, Common Council Vice President after being elected to the Common Council for more than 20 years. She's also served on the South Bend Community School Board in the past and previously worked here at Indiana University South Bend for more than 40 years. Welcome and thank you all for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. We're going to start by giving each candidate one minute to introduce themselves to the viewers and explain the reasons why they're running this year. The campaigns all agreed on the format. We're going to start alphabetical with alphabetically with our Oliver Davis Jr. You have one minute for your opening statement. Sir. Thank you so much and thank you for all the sponsors, Dr. Binion, ISB Democracy Club, and our League of Women Voters and ABC. I am so thankful that you all are here too in South Bend. You came on out here and are watching by line. My name is Oliver Davis. My cell phone number is 574 876 6938. I said 574 876 6938. And I'm experienced, I'm prepared, and I'm available to answer your call to be your South Bend Common Council member at large. People in the past in my professional and, and um, career, they took the time to call me. They called me when, somebody calling me now. Uh, <laughs> uh, they took the time to call me when they were dealing with water problems and everything else that was going on. And when they were dealing with homeless issues and flooding issues, they called me and I answered the call. So Oliver Davis answers the call. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. That was good timing on the phone, by the way. Um, <laughs> We are now gonna to go to Ms. Hammond uh, for your opening statement. You have one minute as well. Thank you. So I wish to thank everyone that has made this debate possible. When I ran in 2019, I promised to be an independent voice for the people of South Bend. I have done that. I have done that by pushing for the Community Police Review Board, advocating for an increase in the minimum wage for city employees, and working to protect the dignity of the homeless and all other members in our community. I've done so keeping in mind that the Common Council is a co-equal branch of government, not just a part of the administration, a co-equal branch. And that is why I ask the difficult questions, even when sometimes that makes people uncomfortable. But this is what you should expect this is what you deserve. And if I am given four more years, 
this is what you can expect from me. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hammond. All right, next up is Laquita Hughes. You also have one minute for your opening statement, ma'am. My name is Laquita Hughes. I'm a mother, a minister, a small business owner, a child care provider, a public public education advocate and a lifelong resident of Indiana, South Bend, Indiana. I served four years on the South Bend Common Council Community Relations Committee under the leadership of former Councilwoman Regina Williams Preston and current Councilwoman Lori Hannon, who I support. I'm running because a majority of the current Common Council is selling our city away to wealthy elites. I am a woman and a minority business owner. And as someone who works with other disadvantaged businesses, we feel ignored by this council. Under this council, we have witnessed a diversity and inclusion office and the Human Rights uh, Commission fall apart. A majority of the Common Council spent the last three years applauding the director's uh, work while disadvantaged businesses suffered and lacked opportunities. I am running to support the community. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, now time for Rachel Tomas Morgan. You have one minute as well. Thank you. I am Rachel Tomas Morgan. Four years ago, I sought this community support in my first election to public office. Since taking the oath of office as an at-large member of the Common Council, I have served the people of South Bend by upholding the values of inclusion, fairness, and opportunity for all. On the Common Council, I have been a part of the core governing team, working in collaboration with the city administration to move our city forward. Even while serving during a global pandemic, we have accomplished a lot. We are seeing unprecedented development across our city. We're growing population, housing, businesses, jobs, and opportunity. But there is more to do. We cannot stop now. I will continue to move our city forward and that is why I am running for re-election and why I am asking for your support to keep me on council. Thank you, ma'am. All right, uh, last but not least, Karen White, you have one minute, ma'am. Good evening. I would like to thank the sponsors for this beautiful opportunity for all of us to come and share with you. Again, my name is Karen White. You can call me Karen. I've had 33 years of public service and I see it as public service as an elected official. One, as a common council member, school board, and as a retired senior administrator here at IU South Bend. I am a proven uh, leader, committed to action and delivering results for all of our citizens. I encourage you to check my record to that point, and you can call me anytime. My telephone number is 574-229-3100. I am committed to moving forward um, with the experience that I've had. I do listen, I respect everyone, and I do the work that our citizens have elected us to do. So working together, we will move forward. Thank you so much. Ms. White, thank you. And I, I did write down both phone numbers, by the way. <laughs> I'll be calling you later. Uh, time for our first round of questions right now. All of them provided by the League of Women Voters of the South Bend area and the American Democracy Project here at IU South Bend, as well as local voters themselves. Each candidate is going to have one minute to answer each question. And there will be 30 second rebuttals as needed. Uh, if a candidate needs to respond directly. Candidates, you see the time cards right down in front. Obviously, if we get to time, finish your thought, wrap it up so we don't have to cut you off, please. We are gonna start with question number one. And again, we'll begin in alphabetical order and then rotate who goes first for each question. Uh, so question one, the city of South Bend recently agreed to buy South Bend school headquarters downtown, but the district is still struggling financially and considering more school closures and other changes. And while the Common Council has no direct role in education here in the city, question number one is, what can the city do to support public education and keep students from leaving the South Bend community schools? We begin with Oliver Davis Jr. You have one minute, sir. Thank you. Um, I am a school social worker at South Bend Schools. I worked for the corporation for over 12 years, proud to be working at Dickinson and many others. What we need to do is to advocate that we need to market our South Bend Schools. 
many of the other charter schools are coming in, you see billboards coming up, and they say, come to our schools, come to the school. When you have competition, you have to market. You have to go and start with people who are, when they are babies, at the hospital, Memorial Hospital St. Joe, and say, come to South Penn School when you get to five years old. You gotta be able to move forward. You have to have a plan to do that, and have them to move forward from that standpoint. We work together. The South Penn Schools have to have a better relationship from that standpoint. And it is a challenge for the South Penn Schools to have taken a reference Referendum, we get it passed in town and then come back and say we're going to close schools. That's shabby. And so, therefore, we have to be responsible with our monies. When we get extra monies, we got to use it and not move forward and try to um, misuse those monies like I have seen in the past. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Lori Hammond, you have one minute on the same question the schools. Thank you very much. That is correct that the council does not have direct control over the schools, but we did meet with the school board. And we had made a commitment that we would create an education committee that would involve council members as well as school board members. And somehow we dropped the ball on that. If we had put that committee together, we would have a seat at the table when it came time to talk about closure of schools and ways that the city can help to move the school system forward. That being said, we can also make investments in um, auxiliary type of programs. I work with my high school students and I take them to go um, on a trip to the trades so that these kids understand that they have options other than just going off to college. So there are many things that we can do to invest in our schools as a city. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Laquita Hughes, your take on what the city and the Common Council can do to help the school district. Well, the city and the Common Council can help um, the school corporation by first merging together, having town hall meetings, um, being transparent, um, giving parents and residents accurate information, just being honest, involving the children and the youth and the children to be a part of the questions that are uh, arising, and also just um, Talk about the budgets. There are budgets from the Common Council, there are budgets from the school corporation. They need to be merged. The Common Council and the South Bend School Corporation need to come together, work as one for the city of South Bend and the kiddos. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Rachel Tomas Morgan, your take. Thank you. It is important to have a strong partnership between the city and South Bend schools. What the challenge is, is trying to figure out what is the best way the city should partner with the schools and the school corporation. I am proud to have prioritized expanding pre-K across our city and in areas of greatest need. That was a top priority of mine in the last three budget cycles. It's important that the city support uh, other services after school, summer programming, career and workforce development that relate to our schools. And so those are some of the ways that the city can support our schools moving forward. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. White, your take. Yes. In terms of supporting our schools, we have to have the real, come to the realization that our schools are very critical to the overall success of our community. We have to create authentic engagement uh, from the city as well as working very closely with the school uh, corporation. And another area that is so important is that these are our schools and we're part of the narrative and we have to have commitment individually but also collectively that we're going to do our best to ensure that our schools are successful. They're in our communities, these are our children and we need our schools to be a school corporation of choice and we have to help them to control that narrative and we have to invest I ask each and every one of you that are sitting in the audience when was the last time that you invest in our school corporation and most importantly with our youth thank you ma'am all right candidates on to question number two this one's about public safety uh, what is the best way in your opinion to curb crime in South Bend should the city increase police staffing technology and budgets or should resources be shifted away from police and toward more community support programs this time we're going to begin with Ms. Hammond thank you um, now that we have our police force up to par as far as the number of police officers now we can be reactive 
um, proactive, excuse me, instead of being reactive, which is what we were forced to do when we had so few police officers. But now we have the staffing to be able to get into the neighborhoods. It's really important that we focus on a community-based policing model and that they practice what is called procedural justice. This allows the individuals to be able to tell their side of the story, to be able to feel that they have a role in the policing in our city, and they're treated with dignity. And that's what the Community Police Review Board is intended to do, is to give folks a voice when they feel that they have been wronged. And that's why I've been pushing for the last two years to make sure that this is enacted. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Hughes, your take. Well, um, in some cases, increasing police staffing, it may help reduce crime. Um, for instance, investing uh, in advanced technology, it can improve uh, crime uh, detection and response times while providing officers with better tools and training um, to enhance effectiveness. Reducing resources away from policing can help in other cases by uh, assisting by addressing the root cause of crime. Do we know the root cause? Do we know what's going on? Um, it may be more effective in reducing the rates. So this can um, involve investing in education, mental health, services, job training, affordable housing, um, to create a more equitable and stable society. So by addressing the underlying social and economic issues, that can lead to crime. So communities may be able to prevent criminal behavior before it occurs. I think that's what we need to do. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Tomas Morgan, your take. Yes. Reducing crime demands a data-informed, multidisciplinary response with solutions that strengthen both community and enforcement-based approaches. I supported providing resources for our police in the form of pay increases and residency incentives, along with resources for effectively recruiting. They have resulted in the gains we see today for the first time in a long time, South Bend's police force will soon be fully staffed, and we have the most diversity in police recruits. I also supported resources for enhanced technology and the creation of the Violent Crimes Unit and the Real-Time Crime Center as critical to solving crimes and, in turn, helping to deter crime. Both personnel and technology investments are critical to reducing crime and enhancing public safety in our community. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. White, your take on the best way to curb crime in the city. I um, began to look at this issue years ago when I was researching the best way to go about reducing crime is to identify the causes. We tend to reflect and look on the result, but we have to address the root causes that we know really uh, respond or you see that is um, reflected in gun violence within our community. It's a community issue. We have the resources, we have the technology. I do believe in community policing. I think that our police officers, since we're up to full strength, that they can be more in the community, establishing relationships, and really understanding the residents in which they have been uh, hired to serve. And again, education, communication, respect, engagement, everyone working together to ensure that our city can become the safest city possible. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Hughes, you wanted a 30-second rebuttal. Yes. Um, our crime reduction plan looks like Republicans wrote it. We, are, we have spent over $3 million in expected, uh, three, 3 million is expected to be spent on the facial recognition technology that research, research shows is not crime deterrent, but it has racist results as, as supported by the majority of the council. Thank you, ma'am. We've got to get to Dr. Davis as well, though. He did, did not get a chance. What's your take on the best way to curb crime in South Bend? As a licensed clinical social worker, I believe that we need to have a more of a mental health approach when it comes down to our crime. When people come, and especially with those who have mental health issues, when somebody calls 911, that person who has a mental health issue may be liable to get hurt even from 911 more than any others. And so we have to manage that and to integrate our social workers into our mental health. Another key thing for me, I don't just think about crime as just a typical crime of the police and everything else. I think about environmental crime.
Environmental crime is Beck's Lake. Environmental crime is Drury's. Environmental crime is when they were trying to build the homeless on um, land that was contaminated. That's crime. And so we have to widen our thought with public services and public safety is the whole concept of how we're going to do with environmental crime. Because those things go together as, lead, as long as lead poisoning. Lead poisoning is also a crime. So we have to not just look at crime as the regular police issues, but also an environmental concept of crime. Thank you, sir. Uh, you wanted to make a rebuttal as well, ma'am? I did. In regards to the Real-Time Crime Center, I am a native area, um, from Detroit area. They have spent millions of dollars and have full coverage throughout the entire city of Detroit with cameras. And there is no evidence that this deters crime in the neighborhoods. I have sat with um, council members from Detroit this system is extremely problematic, and if you look at the research from the universities, there is really no evidence that this deters crime. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Let's move on to question number three. Do you support the creation of a new mental health crisis response center and mobile crisis teams in the city to take some pressure off police officers when it comes to dealing with the mentally ill? We touched on that a little bit just a moment ago. Ms. Hughes, your take on that. Can you repeat the question? Uh, what do you think about uh, the creation of a new mental health crisis response center and mobile crisis response teams? Do you support those? I support them. Um, I believe that it is necessary. Mental health is at its highest uh, rise here um, in Michiana. Um, youth have been experienced by mental health, adults, COVID. We've experienced a lot, loss of jobs, um, homelessness, et cetera. I support it, it's necessary, um, and we need to uh, come together. Um, if I am elected on the Common Council, we need to come together and, and discuss budgets and ways to allocate funding um, into those projects. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Tomas Morgan, what's your take on a new mental health crisis response center and mobile crisis teams? Simple answer, absolutely support it. Two years ago, the council supported um, resources to support um, and resource the Behavioral Crisis Center in South Bend. Uh, as we know, the County Council reneged on their support for that, and so the city stepped up uh, and is providing funding for uh, the initiation of the Behavioral Crisis Center. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of our city for having stepped up to do that. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Karen White, your take on, on the same issue. Yes, uh, most definitely. I too supported the need for a behavioral uh, center for our residents, for our police officers, for our children. We know that the pandemic has disproportionately impacted underrepresented uh, individuals within our community, but all of us, we're not the same. And the mental health, I see it within our schools, I see it throughout our community. So I'm just very proud to have been a supporter of that particular uh, service. And I think that we need to do more. The county did not come forward at the level that they did, but this city, through the council, we stood up and we said, yes, it's important. We did more than talk. We put money behind that to ensure that this center is going to be for all of our citizens. And this is just the beginning. There's much more that needs to be done, but we are up to the challenge and we will move forward and we will support our citizens, especially those that are in need of mental health services. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Davis, your take. This is right in your wheelhouse, I guess. Right in my wheelhouse. As a social worker, I truly believe in mental health and in helping others to uplift themselves, especially during these times when we have seen depression and other challenges being increased. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize, um, Elkhart County has Oakland. That's their mental health center. The Bowen Center takes care of Marshall. In South Bend, in our St. Joe County, we don't have any. Madison Center closed. When Madison Center closed, that's the um, organization I came, we do not have a center. And so at school, when I'm dealing with children who are age um, sixth grade, seventh grade, there is no place to send them. We have to send our children down to Plymouth. How many of my parents can go to Plymouth? So therefore, we have to make sure that we have that coverage and not give back on the, um, 
issue for the county. We got to fight them and do, make sure they're going to do this because in, we end up taking all of Mishawaka's, all of the county issues, and they are not going to pay in. So while we want to build our program, we also have to make sure that those coming from Mishawaka and everything else will also be able to pay their fair share. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Hammond, what's your take? Thank you. Pretty much since I've been serving on the council, one of my primary focuses is working with the homeless in our community. I um, went and served them when they were a tent community in the old BMV parking lot. I assisted in moving them over to the Motels for Now program, and I have been fighting alongside with Our Lady of the Road to keep that program open. I would like to extend my thank you to the mayor for announcing today the additional monies to keep that open for another year. I applaud him for his insight, recognizing how necessary this program is. A number of folks, homeless or not, are dealing with mental health challenges. The crisis center, as well as the emergency um, crisis unit, is essential. These people do not belong in jail. They do not belong being um, trying to find their way to deal with the police officers who are not trained to deal with them. So we absolutely need crisis services in the city as well as a low intake um, center for our homeless. Thank you, ma'am. Next question uh, related to public safety. For the past several years, South Bend has been working to start a civilian police review board to investigate complaints against police officers. And two candidates were just recommended to the mayor by the Common Council last night. So, do you support the establishment of a civilian police review board? And who should appoint its director? The mayor, the city clerk, or the Common Council itself? This time we're going to begin with Rachel Tomas Morgan. Uh, well, we are where we find ourselves. So we are in a situation where the Common Council has recommended to the mayor two candidates, two very strong candidates um, for the mayor's consideration to be director of our first civilian police review board. As uh, someone who was involved in that process, um, I was impressed by both of these candidates. They are leaders in our community, heavily invested in our community, and I would be confident with either of them in the position. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. White, what's your take on the uh, Police Civilian Review Board? I'm just so happy that we were able to not only interview a number of candidates, but also that we're able to uh, present to the mayor two top candidates. Uh, we started out, we had some missteps, uh, but we're now at the point that those names have been submitted to the mayor. And uh, at this point, according to the ordinance, that our job is to make recommendations, the mayor would make a decision, and then the next step would be is that once that uh, person has been hired, we go to the next steps, and that is to begin to put uh, arms and legs to uh, the office in terms of budget, in terms of training, in terms of working, to have the board members as well. So I'm very supported, I'm very excited, and I hopefully the community is excited as well. This has been a long time coming, but we got it done. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Davis, your take on a civilian police review board. Thank you. In 2014, when I was blessed to be president of the council, Councilman Henry Davis, Councilwoman Valerie Shea, and I sponsored this bill. And so here we are, nine years later, and we are finally here but we sponsored it. This was our baby, this is the one we were pushing. We should not take nine years to do something like this. It should have done, been done earlier than that because it's very important. And it should never have been in the clerk's office. The clerk's the clerk. It should always have been in, in the mayor's office. When we designed this, it was never designed for it to be in the clerk's office. And so all the scudderbug that went over in the clerk's office with that should have never been there in the first place. For those of us, the original owners of that, it's the mayor's responsibility to handle those kind of things. People like the mayor should have that responsibility if you don't trust the mayor to have that responsibility, why do you elect that person to be mayor? And so therefore, when we did, we trusted the mayor to have it in there, and then it got shifted to the clerk, which it should never have been. I'm glad our council has moved forward nine years later. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well said. Uh, Ms. Hammond, your take on the same issue. Yes. 
I appreciate the work that was done in 2014. I was one of the three sponsors of the current bill that we were able to get passed. And um, the situation with the original director is very unfortunate. We can't keep dwelling on what happened there. The reason it was put in the clerk's office is from pretty um, significant pressure from the community that they did not want it in the mayor's office. Well, state statute allows us two places, clerk's office or the mayor's office. So it's one or the other. One of my concerns is we could have seated the board by now. Those are appointments from the council members, not from the director. We could have already started training. These people could be well on their way to being trained, which would cut back on a number of months that it's now going to take to get these people up to speed. But unfortunately, as Councilwoman Thomas Morgan says, we are where we are. So let's do this as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, and get the board seated. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Hughes, your take on the same issue. Well, in 2014, um, I was working on the committee, the Community Relations Committee. So I was working with the former council uh, members trying to push this particular uh, issue out, trying to get a, uh, a board going, um, just um, adhering to what the community was saying in reference to um, issues that they were having pertaining to law enforcement, pertaining to school, et cetera, SROs. And so I totally agree with it. Um, as uh, Councilwoman Lori Hammond said, I am just, um, a little irritated that it took so long to happen. However, we are here now. And so, um, as Rachel said, you know, uh, Tomo said, uh, we're glad that we're here. However, it should not have taken that long. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a couple, couple 30 second rebuttals. Go ahead, Ms. White. Yes. Yes, we're here. It's taken some uh, time to get to the point, but I would like to say that according to the ordinance, if you read the ordinance, there was only two. Um, offices than which that this person could respond to. That was the clerk's office as well as the mayor. That has already been stated to clarify that. This community did not want to see the director reporting to the mayor's office. We listened, we responded. So that's how that happened. And there's been a lot of debate about who did what and what didn't happen, but we're at this point now. And I would hopefully think that our community would rally behind this particular initiative and this office because it's needed. We've worked very hard. I was one of the sponsors for the current uh, ordinance, time and we put in a lot of time, but get behind us. We got it done, and there's still much work to do, and we need you to really become more engaged, and Your we will get that done. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't want to cut you off, but I have That's to if fine. I have to. Uh, you wanted to say something as well. I did. I, uh, I too, want to address the length um, that it took. So we found ourselves in a situation on a council with a weak ordinance. There were gaps in the ordinance. There was a lot that we needed to address. Um, but we all agreed that it was important to move it forward and passed it under the agreement that it had a lot of work to do. It was the other members of the council who worked to be able to put some processes in place, to processes in place to hire a director and to put the board uh, in place. Thank and you, those were missing in the original ordinance. Ms. Hammond, you wanted a rebuttal as well? Yes, um, we worked for a year. We had multiple meetings with community members, even during COVID. And I thank our VPA organization. They set up meetings outside in the parks so that we could meet with the community. The ordinance addressed all of the desires that the community came forward with. I get a little tired of hearing about procedural this and procedural that. We know, you know anytime you pass an ordinance, there is likely to be amendments necessary. It was a good ordinance, it passed, and now we're moving forward. Could Thank you, ma'am. And I agree with um, our councilwoman, because to try to make perfect the enemy of good is ridiculous. And so therefore, it should have started. 
and you build upon it. We had the Wright brothers that started with the plane, and now we have jets. But if they had waited for jets, we never would have flown. And so and that's the problem here. And that's where we should have been able to move forward with this issue. And the mayor is still involved in it. He was involved with it throughout the whole process, but they blame it on the clerk. And so one of the reasons why I wanted in the mayor's office is the buck stops there. He's the chief CEO of the, of the whole city. Boom. Let him handle it. Not blame it on the clerk. I think everybody's gotten a 30-second rebuttal. Now. I appreciate so it. Let's continue on, all right? Uh, the next question, safe, affordable housing is an issue for many families here in South Bend. Our next question, what can the city do to help improve subsidized housing options and hold unscrupulous landlords responsible? This time we're going to start with Ms. White. Yes, the, we do have uh, procedures and processes in place to deal with uh, individuals and businesses who do not uphold their in in terms of the grievance that we have or they have with us. We have been very, very much involved, working very closely with the administration and the council members. If you begin to look at the number of housing units that will be coming or have been, been built in our community, it's unprecedented. And a number of them do have affordable housing units within their units. So again, um, we're moving. We, if you go back and I can give you the names of all the different units and what locations that they're being built. And so uh, we recognize that we do not have adequate uh, housing for our residents and that is the top priority that we'll be working towards continuously. It's not going to stop and we want to make sure that all our residents have decent, affordable housing. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Davis, your take on improving the quality of housing stock. One of the big things that we have to be aware of is what's coming in the month of May. Property taxes are going up. Property taxes, get ready, everybody. If you haven't seen them, get ready. Because when property taxes go up, that is going to affect all of us who have mortgages, number one. Then it's going to affect everybody who's rent. Because what's going to happen is they're going to take the rent and put it on the people who rent, whether you live in an apartment or whether you live in a house. And that is something that we have to start talking about. Yes, the county does that. Yes, the county sets all of those things because they're using different formulas this year. But what are we going to use that money when it comes to the city of South Bend? We need to earmark some of that money to help not only those who are dealing with other housing authority issues, but people who are regularly renting their homes or are owners of their homes are going to have challenges with maintaining their homes because of the high property tax. And that's a serious concern that I have as you have so many people on fixed incomes and now their properties are going to go up. We have to be ready to move forward and help them. Thank you, sir. Ms. Hammond, your take on housing. Yes, the urban problem back in the 60s and 70s was because the money was moving out of the urban centers, leaving behind people that were working at low-income jobs, and we saw deterioration in the neighborhoods. The modern problem is it's become trendy to live in the urban centers. But what we are doing is we are filling the urban centers with extremely high cost homes and rental properties. The a majority of the people in the city can't live in these structures. That is why yesterday at our tax abatement meeting, I made it very clear that the people that are remodeling the Liberty Tower have got to be open to the idea of accepting housing vouchers. And I know that seems like an odd thing, but they have one bedroom apartments that they are putting in. We are offering them tax abatements. They need to give back to the community. And in doing so, I think they need to be accepting those housing vouchers. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Hughes? Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, the question was, what can the city do to help improve subsidized housing options and hold unscrupulous landlords responsible? Well, the city can develop inclusive zoning policies um, by implementing zoning regulations um, and encourage the construction of affordable housing units, such as inclusionary zone, zoning and density bonuses, to promote a diverse mix of housing options for residents at various of income levels. Um, they can also leverage public land and resources by identifying um, the under underutilized public land and properties that can be um, redeveloped. 
They can preserve the existing affordable housing stock, establish programs and policies to maintain and upgrade the existing affordable housing. Um, they can also support the community land trusts, the CLTs, encourage and establish um, and the establish and the expansion of CLTs, which can which can acquire, develop and maintain affordable housing for long term, not short term, but long term, and ensuring that it remains accessible to low income families. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Uh, Ms. Tomas Morgan, your take on that. Yeah, South Bend has been no exception to the national trend of mm -hmm. shortage of affordable housing. The way to address this in any community is to increase the housing supply across the board. It's a simple supply and demand solution. As chair of the council's community investment committee, I've worked closely with the department and I'm proud of the ways the city has expanded affordable housing over the past three years across our city. This year alone, three South Bend projects were awarded competitive tax credit credits and two of those projects were located in the southern district of the downtown area. Since 2019, there's been a total of 100 of 1,500 uh, units added to South Bend's housing stock with a quarter of those designated affordable housing units. We must continue this work of increasing the housing supply in our community and affordable housing at that. At the same time, it's also critical to ensure housing security by expanding protections for renters and reducing evictions. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. White, you wanted a 30-second rebuttal? I don't we'll see this as a rebuttal, but I would want to respond in regards to the property taxes that I have already reached out to Mr. Murphy, because I do know that April is spread around the corner to be able to get all this information in regards to not only the impact that the property, property taxes will have on our citizens, but where those monies are being distributed to because the city does not get all of those income. And so we will, I will along with our council, will be um, uh, having a number of meetings to really share that information with our residents because I do know when they do receive their property taxes that they are going to be shot. Uh, that's something to look forward to, I guess. Uh, you wanted to say something as well? Oh, go ahead. Well, that's why I, that's why I mentioned it tonight. But I was concerned with our councilwoman, um, who, Ms. Rachel, who said that it's a simple task. This is not a simple task. Okay, and when you're dealing with housing, I worked on my doctorate in terms of homelessness. That's not a simple task because a lot of times people have credit issues. We've gone through a financial challenge of everything else and things are not so simple when you have come for trying to feed your family and everything else. What may look simple to those of us sitting up here is not simple when you're trying to feed your family and, and children. We never should think of these things as so simple because that is a way to undermine what people have to go through in their own lives. We have to do better than that. Ms. Tomas Morgan, did you want to reply to that? Uh, yes, I think there was a confusion in what I had said. I said that no, uh, in, a, in addressing affordable housing in the city, it is a simple solution to increase the housing stock in the city. Thank you, ma'am. Did you want to add something? I would. Um, I'm an economist, and I understand supply and demand very well. Mm -hmm. We continue to hear this concept that if we just increase supply, just increase supply. Housing prices are very sticky. very sticky. That's an econ word if you aren't familiar. And what that means is it's gonna take a very long time for housing costs to come down. We are still going to be, be paying exorbitant prices mm -hmm. for rentals in this city for a very long time. Other things need to be done to address the um, affordable housing shortage that we have here. Well, that brings us to our next question. Oh, wait, we have more rebuttals. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I just wanted to add that the city council never created an affordable housing plan. Not only that, an affordable housing plan that uses it to help those in need. Mm -hmm. um, housing is a great target for those funds. Also, the, the city spent over $1 million in reserves and the city council sits on it rather than help those in need. Um, we really need to look at the data and, and, and really speak to the questions with truth. Thank, Thank you. you. We good? Can I move on? No? Oh, One no. more? No. She's next. Go ahead. Okay. I'm first. <laughs> You're first. We're, we're going to run out of time okay. here, so I want to move on. I just want to um, address that. Uh, 
Um, as someone who, is, who teaches uh, global poverty and economic development uh, at the university level, the, the principle of supply and demand is, is when supply is up, then the demand, the competition, decreases. So pricing does decrease when supply is higher. We see that today in, uh, after the pandemic, there's a supply shortage of um, goods and um, prices go up in that case. All right, we're gonna move on. I gotta, I gotta get to the next question, and, and it's kind Don't of worry. related. So, uh, economic growth and development. Now, while the city has had success attracting investment downtown and around Four Winds Field, residents and parts of the city feel left behind. So what can the city do to encourage more balanced private development in economically struggling areas of the city? This time, we're gonna start with Dr. Davis. We need to make sure that every part of our city, all six districts, have equitable funding. Equitable funding is not equal funding. When you have Christmas time or holiday time and you have six children, you want to give them equitable funding because one person may have to have three gifts and the other one's two depending on what you're giving. But you have to look at equitable funding because if you're only giving everything to four of the children and not to two, it's going to be a war at Christmas. And so they looked at, where's mine? And that's what's happened when the people of some districts come in there and they say, where's mine? When they see this district has gotten theirs and another district has gotten theirs and we only get a little thing and they get this, where's mine? And as a therapist, that creates counseling, counseling challenges and people come see me when they do that in their families. Well, if you do that in the city, you come see me again at budget time. And so therefore we have to do that. So budget time is the key thing for our city council. The budget is what we have to do and our budget has has to be equitable, not one side versus the other side or this side versus that side. The bow tie means we all do it together. We all tie it together, and that's what we have to do, tie it together. Now it's my time. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Ms. Hammond, your take on uh, development all around the city. Thank you. I do think it's really important that we not try to pit one area of the city against another. But I would challenge anyone to go for a walk with me on the west side on the south side and the southeast side and tell me that there has been equitable investment in this city. Mm -hmm. There has not. Mm -hmm. There are sections of our city where the curbs and the sidewalks are crumbling. There are sections of the city where it is obvious that code is just ineffective in dealing with the number of concerns we really have got to target how we um, appropriate our dollars. We have to be painfully honest and identify those communities that have been disenfranchised this entire time. And some will get more than others, as Mr. Davis said, because that is the equitable solution. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Thank Hughes, you. your take on balancing development in different areas of the city? My take on it is, is this. We need to invest in unders underserved areas. We need to provide direct public investments. We need to encourage local entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship. We need to support small businesses and entrepreneurs in disadvantaged areas, as Lori Hammond said. We need to work on the workforce development and, tra and training. We need to partner with local educational institutions. We also need to create incentive, inclusive development strategies that offer incentives for developers and businesses that commit to equitable hiring practices, affordable housing, and also our community benefits um, within projects that the city is partnering in for each neighborhood. We also need to monitor progress and also evaluate impact uh, we need to regularly assess the impact of economic development efforts on different parts of the city. Different parts, all. We don't need to leave out not one, not two. And we need to adjust strategies as needed to ensure that growth is more widely distributed. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Tomas Morgan, your take on this one. In 2019, I ran on wanting to extend community and economic investments to all corners of the city. Over the past few years, South Bend has seen unprecedented development across the city and especially in parts of the city that have not seen develop investment in a long time. These include expansion of public Wi-Fi. We hope to expand broadband as we capture state and federal dollars coming our way. This is, includes an expansion of affordable workforce housing options on vacant land. 
uh, and in vacant buildings, and an expansion of pre-K opportunities in areas of greatest need. We are also building a new MLK Dream Center to create opportunities for youth in the West Side neighborhoods and to activate the Linden Avenue Business Corridor. Small businesses across the city can get a facelift with the new Vibrant Places grants as well. Um, we are keeping, expanding, attracting businesses and industry to South Bend in parts of the city that we haven't seen it in the Southwest side, in the North, uh, in the in the northwest sides of town. I am committed to building on this progress. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. White, your take on development across the city. I love this question, because in 2019, the residential committee, we intentionally took our meetings from the chamber. We went into neighborhoods that we had identified that needed attention. Those neighborhoods were, were in the second, some of the first and some of the six. We had intentional discussions. From that particular meeting, this was the first time in the history since I've been a member of the South Bend Common Council that a committee presented our findings as part of the budget process. I can give you the link to that, that study, those recommendations, but we did more than talk. We went to those communities. We acknowledged the issues that they had experienced, the, the lack of investment. We listened, we made recommendations, and we did get positive outcomes. And so I'm very proud of that. COVID interrupted, but that is still a top commit, uh, commitment for me. And my love is the neighborhoods, and I'm committed to continue to do the work. All right, we're quickly running out of time. We've got Go time for one more question, and I, but I got to cut the answers to 30 seconds on this one, and it's, it's a very good question. Unfortunately, I have to cut the time. Uh, right now, the Common Council is considering reparations for the city's black residents because of past segregation, discrimination, and bank redlining. So the question is, do you support the city of South Bend paying reparations, and should they be cash payments or geared more toward targeted investments, financial opportunities, education, and job training? Ms. Hammond, let's start with you. I do um, support reparations, but reparations can come in a number of forms. And I think what is most important for us as a city is to talk to those who are qualified to receive these reparations. What do they want them to look like? Do they want that to be in the form of investment? Do they want that to be job training? What is it that this community, the affected community, is asking for? This isn't for us to decide. This is for them to decide. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Hughes, your take on reparations in the city. Um, I would like to say that we need to always involve the community. We need to get their take on what needs to happen, their thoughts, you know, things like that. And we also need to look at the $100 million that's in the reserves and see how we can put monies towards these type of uh, programs and also just continue to have town hall meetings to educate the public and get their insight as well. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Tomas Morgan. Reparations is an important conversation that's happening nationwide and happening here in South Bend, and I support that ongoing conversation. Um, reparations can look like many forms. Um, I've been researching and studying this um, over these past months, and I support our council president, McBride, who uh, is establishing a task force for the study of reparations in our community. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. White. Yes, this is a very important topic that has had um, drastic impact uh, on, a, um, on our citizens as well as those who have really experienced discrimination and other types of uh, um, racism in regards to uh, looking at some of the past history. The state of uh, Illinois is the first state, if I'm not mistaken, in the country that has passed you know, financial uh, payment to uh, individuals within their state. I tend to believe and I do believe that we need to have really a, a community-wide discussions because it's more than monies. We can look at our policies, we can look at our education system, we can look at housing. And so it, to me, we need to take a holistic look at it, but it is important and it's the community and especially those who are greatly impacted, they need to be at the table as well. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Oliver Davis, you get the last word on this question. One of the things that I've seen so many people do is study and study and study and study and study. So when it was being put out there, then they sent it over to uh, one of my key um, co colleagues. Oh, we put it into a study so we can study again. Well, when my tire breaks down, I don't need to study if I have a flat tire. Let me study and study when it's 35 degrees below zero. I'm going to study this. We need to change the tire. Okay, and keep moving forward with this. And this council, with all due respect, to put that in under the last our current person was ridiculous. It was something out there from our current council person, and you were pushing it. They needed to have addressed it, put it out there, make changes, and everything else. But don't be studying your flat tire when it's 35 degrees below zero. Change the tire. All right, we are running out of time, so I want to move to our closing statements. Each candidate will have 30 seconds to answer a very simple question. Why should primary voters cast their ballots for you when selecting the best council candidate? We're going to do this in reverse alphabetical order, beginning with Karen White. You have 30 seconds. I would say check my record, um, look at the things that I've done, my commitment, my consistency, the time that I put in, because I see myself as a public servant. I'm committed to doing the work. I'm able to talk with anyone. I, I work very closely with not only elected officials, but also with our stakeholders and the community. I am the person that you can look towards, that you can understand and also know that I would get the job done. I may not do it the way that you want it to be done, but it will get done. So vote for me and uh, you can hold me accountable because I am your council person, and I'm committed to serving you as my constituents. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Tomas Morgan. As an immigrant to the United States, I want South Bend to be the best virgin, version of what this country can be, a place that is open and welcoming for all, a bustling and vibrant community, a strong city for future generations where everyone is included in the city's opportunities, progress, and success. That South Bend is within reach if we continue to commit to building on our progress. I am Rachel Tomas Morgan. It has been an honor and a privilege to serve as your at-large representative on South Bend's Common Council. I humbly ask for your support to reelect me and for your vote on May 2nd. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we are go now gonna go to Laquita Hughes, your turn. We often hear about the gains Republicans are making in St. Joseph County, and unfortunately, I see these policies being mimicked by our current city council. We need to return to the base of the Democratic Party and our ideas. We need to empower teachers, seniors, child care providers, LGBTQ folks, single parents, youth, and homeless um, and houseless people. I am running to work for you for the city of South Bend. I live it and I love it. So now let's get, now let's get out and vote. Let's get um, our Democratic votes in and let's vote and thank you and God bless. Thank you, Ms. Hughes. Lori Hammond, you are next. Thank you. I feel confident that over the last three and a half years, my record speaks for itself. I am willing to cooperate and work with anyone who, is, who has the people of South Bend at heart. We work toward solving some of the biggest problems that the people in South Bend are facing. Right now, I want to encourage everyone to vote. This is a very critical election. There is so much at stake. All you have to do is look at the county to see what is possible in terms of the absolute fallout and disaster that can occur in the city. Tell everyone you know to vote. Make a plan to go vote. And on that list, make sure Lori Hammond is on your list of people to vote for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now to Dr. Davis, you have 30 seconds as well, sir. My name is Oliver Davis. My cell phone number is 574-876-6938. Please call, please vote on May the 2nd and in early vote. I talk about my number because I've given out my number all throughout my career because I believe in the personal relationship with people. People stop me in the barbershop, they stop me in the store, they stop me where I'm eating, when I'm going out on a date, they stop me in the middle of everywhere. They stop me. I don't get mad about it because I gave them my cell phone number and I do answer the call. Answer the call for Oliver Davis on May the 2nd and I'll keep answering your call. Let's go win this South Bend. Thank you, sir. And thank you to all the candidates. Yeah, a round of applause for all of our candidates.
we definitely appreciate you all taking the time to share your views with South Bend voters tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We'd also like to thank our hosts here at IU South Bend and our sponsors, the League of Women Voters of the South Bend area, the American Democracy Project here at IUSB, with the support from the Political Science Club on campus as well. And special thanks to Dr. Elizabeth Benyon for helping put these events together. Round of applause for her. Remember, early voting in Indiana starts on Monday, April 10th, and primary day is Tuesday, May the 2nd. I'm Brian Connie Bear, ABC 57 News. Thanks for watching, everybody. Don't forget to get out and vote.